No, it's cool. And he was like self-taught a lot of ways, you know, like he's like, 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 Expertise. Uh, yeah. I don't know any There you go. Yeah. That comes to once in a while. That's a deal. Okay, so think it's time to start. So welcome to the last colloquium of the semester, and it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Roger Melka from uh, University of Waterloo and uh, Perimeter Institute in Canada. So uh, Roger is a computational physicist who's done a number of uh, insightful uh, studies and pioneering studies in quantum many body problems. And uh, so just a very brief scientific biography. So. Roger got his PhD from University of California, Santa Barbara in 2005. Okay. And, uh, and there he worked uh, under supervision of Dax Calatina uh, on uh, difficult problems of frustrated magnetism and uh, Albert models and of that kind. And then he was a uh, uh, postdoc, uh, uh, Eugene Wigner Fellow at uh, Oak Ridge uh, National Lab, and after that, uh, moved to uh, University of Waterloo, where he is now associate professor. And so, uh, as I mentioned, so the, he is an author of several uh, very influential papers, uh, and uh, I'll pick mine, a couple of mine, pick a couple of mine, which I. Like, so, so uh, Roger is one of the people who devised uh, quantum numerical schemes to extract entanglement entropy from uh, quantum Monte Carlo simulations at finite temperature. And this uh, paved the way to a, a breakthrough study of quantum spin liquid on a, of hard core bosons on a Kagome lattice. And this was identified with the help again of entanglement entropy, and uh, I still remember just seeing those steps and I was <laughs> feeling uh, deeply impressed, <laughs> and um, still am. And so, and then, so okay, going into 21st century, somewhere in the beginning of it, Google learned how to distinguish cats and dogs. <laughs> and that's really, I think, in the future history of mankind, that would be an important day when this happened. Because uh, since then, all uh, things went uh, developing exponentially. And so, very recently, Roger learned how to identify distinguish quantum dogs from quantum cats uh, by devising a <coughs> by using machine learning to identify phases of quantum interacting uh, many body systems. And that's what we'll learn about more today. So, Roger, welcome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Oleg. I'm glad you mentioned uh, frustrated magnetism and so on, because I feel like what I'm still doing is an extension of the, all this early work that we did in the field on frustrated magnetism. And <coughs> I guess what I'm 
going to try to convince you today of is the fact that we can use machine learning as sort of another tool in our toolbox to study uh, some of these most difficult problems in, you know, I guess they call it quantum antibody physics, which which may, which means I think strong correlation physics and condensed matter and some uh, similar you know aspects of quantum information science, which I'll talk about. So before I start, I just want to acknowledge my students. You'll see some of their names on various papers as they go through the talk. Juan Carasquilla, uh, who was a postdoc at Perimeter, uh, was really <coughs> in instrumental in getting me started in this field of machine learning. He's now faculty at the Vector Institute. So these are my affiliations that they don't pay me, so I put them at the bottom here. <laughs> <laughs> the Vector Institute's a new uh, uh, nonprofit research institute uh, that focuses on machine learning in Toronto. And uh, it's, it's um, headed up by Jeff Hinton, whose uh, name will come up a couple times in my talk. Um, and Juan's, a, Juan's now faculty there. Uh, so yeah, they, we're going to talk about machine learning, which is the new hot topic in physics and computer science and everything. And I guess my first slide is to just contradict that statement. Because I think, it's, I think it, you know, it pays to remember that uh, people have been thinking about artificial intelligence I think people were inspired, really, to think about artificial intelligence when the first digital computers really came out. And so 60 years ago, when all these famous giants in the field, Turing and von Neumann, uh, were building the first digital machines, so probably the first fast, uh, you know, uh, addressable memory digital machine came out of the IS at Princeton, uh, near the end of World War II. Uh, both Turing and von Neumann were thinking about the problem of artificial intelligence. And it's interesting to go back and look at their letters that they were writing back and forth and the different people and so on because Turing wanted to create something he called a child machine, which is a machine where the intelligence had to be imprinted through learning. Uh, you know, and he believed that, this is interesting, he believed that the machine, it's, you know, any machine like this, the, the old ENIAC machine, uh, if sufficiently evolved could could basically achieve what we now call general AI. You know. So this is right at the start of uh, digital computing. Von Neumann, you know, sort of was looking at uh, similar ideas in a very parallel uh, perspective. As we all know, uh, he's a pioneer of ideas and entropy and so on. He really understood what we, we now call complexity. I might call it like Hamiltonian complexity and things like that. He understood that, I think, to create general artificial intelligence, you have to overcome complexity in some sense. This, this, this is going to be a theme of my talk. And he, he really believed that if you looked at natural brains, which somehow, you know, by our own experience, we know uh, match patterns and so on in a, in a way that overcomes complexity, uh, this might be the key to understanding uh, some, of these, uh, uh, some of these problems in AI. And so you have two ingredients. You have learning and you have you know, modeling after brains. So it's almost like neural networks and machine learning were part of the initial ingredients in this kind of line of thought even 60 years ago. I like this. I, you know, I just love to throw up predictions. And I took the names out of these, but these are famous AI researchers from the 50s and 60s and so on. So the, the warning is don't make predictions because you'll be embarrassed in colloquia in the future. But you know, some of these are kind of, you know, Within 10 years, a computer will be the world chess champion. Okay. Well, you know. Machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can, you know, very misogynist right there. Um, <laughs> within a generation of the problem creating, a, people mean a general artificial intelligence and so on. And if you look at recent, uh, you know, breakthroughs, I mean, okay, 97, 96, 97, that's when chess started beating grand champions. I remember IBM Watson on Jeopardy, that was amazing. I don't know if any of you saw that. Uh, Go, you know, Go is highly complex. The number of board positions is something like, I think it's 10 to the 170 or something like that. So it's a massive astronomical, you know, more than astronomical number. And uh, now Go, this is this is two, last year Go was beating uh, uh, the world champion based on uh, learning from human moves, and now they can train artificial intelligence uh, intelligence that has uh, no sort of a priori training on human moves. So basically. A machine, raw machines can beat humans now in that. And of course, all these things we're used to you know, from our iPhones and from the internet, uh, these are all uh, you know, progress towards some sort of general, general AI. 
So starting from touring, again, to put us all in perspective, um, you know, many of us, especially <coughs> older people like me, remember in, in uh, parts of times, times in our career when you couldn't mention neural networks or AI and, or risk losing funding. And that, that's basically what they call now the AI winters, right? <laughs> maybe there's winters in every field. You know, think of high TC or something. I don't know. Maybe there's winters in every field. But this is a rough map from 2009 of, okay, I don't know. This is not a physics plot, but, uh, you know, <laughs> strong, uh, strong funding in AI winters, okay? Turing wrote a letter to the London Times, you know, at the, at the end of the war about his optimism, you know, uh, about artificial intelligence and so on. And uh, there's various workshops, and at some point, people lost interest, and I think, you know, the interest moved to America uh, around this time here, uh, where ARPA had a program uh, that funded, funded AI. Like, like many things, this funding can be killed by a bad referee report. So Lighthill was the referee that basically said nothing was coming out of this our ARPA funding. And then there was this, what, you know, AI winter that occurred in the 80s. Uh, the fifth generation, I, from what I understand is when Japan sort of picked up a lot of the uh, research in AI. I'm not sure what happened in the 90s, but there was another serious AI winter, and this is the one I remember. The neural networks were basically nothing, you know, you wouldn't want to touch them somehow. There's a dot-com bubble, uh, which gave a little bit of uh, life to things. And, and this, you know, this is where the Canadians stepped in. Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, uh, after the internet, in 2004, after the dot-com bubble, uh, started funding this crazy fringe field of uh, of AI, and uh, you know I, I put this on here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, that, what happened in 2012, uh, which I wasn't even aware of until recently, but looking back at the literature, was really when Jeff Hinton, okay, University of Toronto, and uh, his students blew kind of one of these long-standing uh, classification problems wide open. And it was this, you know, they call it something like the Olympics, the Olympics of image recognition or something. You know, they have a conference once a year where they have this, these standard data sets of images and uh, the, the goal is to, to label them or to classify them and do various things, right? So, and, you know, they're, they're, it's fairly, you know, they're fairly, I, I guess, complex images to classify. So 2012 is when Jeff Hinton demonstrated that a type of deep network a con what's called a convolutional network, but it's a type of deep learning, uh, could basically you know, beat any other method in classifying uh, images in this data set. So it's really, I'd say, the start of the current, if you want to call it bubble, uh, or maybe not bubble, revolution in artificial intelligence is, is, can, can essentially be traced back to this one conference proceeding. So a lot of our technology and a lot of the interest in deep neural networks really comes from this, uh, this paper in 20. And you know, we could all aspire to have 15,000 citations uh, from a paper in 2012. So. Okay, so let's get into, you know, less fun things. So, so I've said a bunch of words now, and I just want to, you know, organize these in some rough hierarchy. AI is the, the broad field. Could mean could be many things. Our, you know, human-like intelligence in a robot is usually referred to general AI, but there's also, you know, just the concept of building huge... Uh, AI machines for self-driving cars or you know any anything like that often falls under AI. Machine learning is a set of algorithms um, that we use in AI research, and neural networks is a subset of those algorithms. So there's definitely machine learning that is not neural networks. Deep learning, which I really won't talk too much about, um, but it's really again the you know the, the power behind uh, this sort of revolution here. Is, is again just a subset of neural networks where you essentially you're stacking these objects on top of each other, and so I'll, I'll, I'll focus on machine learning with neural networks for the rest of the talk, um, and I want to kind of think about how we might use this in my field of physics, which is strong correlated physics, uh, condensed matter, uh, stat mech, and so on. So machine learning for us is used uh, in cases where an algorithm that, that I design, if I hard code, uh, hard code um, uh, some sort of algorithm, uh, it's, it's maybe not giving me what I want. So what I'm imagining is data. And you know, depending on your field, you picture data different. Maybe I have a, what a structure factor from neutron scattering. Uh, this is a configuration of an Ising model. This is some STM image. This is a 
one of those, um, you know, cold atoms, the, uh, the atomic gas microscope image. So I, I have the general idea that I have data and I want to learn something about the features in it or find patterns in the data and then tie these patterns to underlying physical theories and so on. So machine learning is the idea that um, I, I program a computer that can adapt when I give it different data. Okay, so the, the programming itself uh, uh, learns from the data. That's what learning means. As opposed to being, uh, you know, as opposed to explicitly designing an algorithm to look for data. So I can explicitly code in an ordering wave vector in a Fourier transform, or I could somehow, you know, not do that and, and design an algorithm that learns based on the different data that I, I give to it. So within machine learning, there's different sub fields, if you want, or strategies, I guess I would call them. Um, and there's maybe more than this, but the, the big three are supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. So just to differentiate, supervised is when I have a label. So if I can produce data like this, and I can label it as a mod insulator or a BEC, that label is somehow the, the supervision part. And what I do is I want to learn a rule that maps all of those individual atomic uh, positions to that label, mod insulator. Right, so it's mapping, it's a function that maps the pixels to the label. Most data in the world out there is not label. When you, when you go on Facebook, I'm not on Facebook, but if, if you're on Facebook and you're labeling your friend, or what is it, tagging your friends, you're basically training the world's biggest supervised learning database. You know, so when the, the, the image, you know, the picture of you, uh, you know, when, when Facebook learns to label that with your name, it's done that because people have explicitly labeled, you know, uh, done supervised learning with labeling. Um, most data is not labeled. Is you, you know, you, you, somebody has to a priori uh, assign those labels. And so when you don't have labels, the, the strategy is a bit different. The tasks are a bit different for machine learning. Uh, one is clustering. If you go on your iPhone and look uh, under your photos, it'll say people, and you'll have People's, you'll, you'll, it does a pretty good job of clustering. It'll like identify me, me with a beard, me without a beard, so it's not perfect. You know, my wife, my dog. So there's no labels assigned to that. It's just clustered all the, all the images of the same person together. So that's one goal of unsupervised learning. So you, know, you can do some sort of machine learning algorithm to generate, to find these clusters. Find associations between, you know, if I'm always in the same picture with my wife, there's some association there, right? And, and that's another task of uh, unsupervised learning. <coughs> generative modeling is what I'm going to talk about later. And generative modeling means if I train a neural network, say, on images of myself, I can later ask that neural network to produce or to generate what it thinks I look like. I mean, why would you do that? I'll, I'll explain. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't always have data either. When, you're drive, you know, when Uber wants to make a self-driving car, you can't, you know, take an infinite amount of cars, drive them correctly, drive them incorrectly, crash them, get them home safely, and so on, right? So when you don't have explicit data, that's where reinforcement learning comes in. And you basically give the, there's an agent that you give uh, uh, rewards or punishments to. So the, a software agent drives a car. If it gets you home safely, it's a reward. If it crashes, it's a punishment. And so you build that into a, a sort of, uh, you know, machine learning uh, paradigm without without data. This is how most gameplay uh, works, like beating Atari games or beating Go or something like that. It's often reinforcement learning. So let's start with supervised learning, which I think is conceptually the simplest. And, well, for condensed matter stat mech people, the Ising model of supervised learning is the MNIST data set. Okay? So, so the, what, what, the, what MNIST is, is a, a, a set of handwritten, so it's a data set of handwritten digits 504, blah, blah, blah. There's 70,000 of them. They're about 20 by 20 pixels. I think they're actually 28 by 28 grayscale pixels. I think it was U US Census Bureau employees and high school students somehow. People you know, got them to write, write these out and also label them. So they produced a label data set. And from this label data set, you can, uh, you can basically benchmark any of your sort of supervised learning tasks. It's kind of the standard uh, way to, to you know, build these, these machine learning algorithms and, uh, and benchmark them. So we're going to start with the MNIST data set. And oh yeah, and so since we're, since we're physicists, start thinking about what, what that image is. 
and how I would relate it to some of my data sets. So for me, my favorite data set might be configurations of the 2D Ising model. So I'll talk more about it, but imagine that my white pixels are spin down and my black pixels are spin up. I can assign labels to these images. They're configurations, they're state configurations sampled from you know, the, the Hilbert space or whatever. This is most spins down with some thermal fluctuations, most spins up. So these are ferromagnets. You might have one or two labels. This is probably some critical system. This is a paramagnet. So the strategy that I'm going to talk about, I can imagine transferring that to state configurations uh, uh, sort of morally. But, but we'll, we'll stick with MNIST for now. So, <clears throat> so the strategy for handwritten digit recognition is to find that function that maps all of those input pixels that I'm going to throw into my machine. And they're black, you know, each X is either 0 or 1, say if it's black or white. Uh, it's 20 by 20, that's why I put 400 here. And I want an output label, and the output is, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 all the way up to 9. Okay, so you're labeling. Uh, so what you want to do is you basically want to throw in this image, and you want to fire one of these uh, output uh, values. And you want that, that function. There's many ways of doing that, of course. But the strategy uh, behind uh, machine learning with neural networks is to use uh, a uh, is to learn a function that has this kind of graphical representation. So what does this mean? So here's an, here's actually a deep neural network. I'm going to talk about shallow ones, but the idea behind this type of neural network, just kind of schematically, is that I take all the pixels from that image, I strip them all, I raster them somehow into a vector, say, and I feed them zeros or ones into the first layer of the neural network. And then a signal propagates. And a signal propagates through all these layers uh, via what's called you know, like weights, weights or edges of this graph and nodes which are activation functions. So the, the philosophy, the thing you're supposed to think of is, is a, a brain that has neurons that fire and, and they're like gatekeepers for the signal. So if a neuron fires, it sends a signal through. If not, the signal stops there and has to propagate in some other direction. And in the end of the neural network, it would be the output labels. Okay, so here there's only three because I stole this off the internet. But you know, <laughs> there's you know one. You know, in this case there should be ten, right? And the idea is that if your neural network's working properly, you fire the one neuron associated with that you know that label, the proper label, and all the other ones would be zero. Okay, that's just very rough. So we'll come back to this. Uh, let's build up the neural network from basically the activation functions. Well, it's an activation function. So. <laughs> So the activation function here, okay, is, is the node of this graph. And coming into the node are, you know, these lines, the edges of the graphs, and those are called your weights. So here's just one, I just uh, pulled out one, say, neuron from this, this second layer. So here's my input, you know, pixel values, zeros or ones coming in here. These edges are called weights. And the neuron is an activation function, which allows a signal to go through it or not, say. And there's also a bias associated with that neuron. So that neuron is just a function. It's that activation function. It's a nonlinear function. So for example, uh, a recurring theme that we'll talk about is a sigmoid function. So a sigmoid function is just the, you know, this functional form. If this is uh, Z and this is you know, sigma, okay, then, then you can see you can either have a 0, a 1, or you can have some sort of range in between. Okay? So you can fire it. You can not fire the neuron or you can kind of be in this intermediate regime. That argument Z on the x-axis is you know, the sum of all weights uh, and, and a bias. Oh, so I labels the neuron, and J is labeling all of these uh, you know, x, you know, elements of this x vector coming in. Okay? So that's, that's you know, an activation function. When I show you a sigmoid as a physicist, you right away say, why? Why not some other nonlinear? Why not something like a step function? And I think the point is that there's many different activation functions. So the philosophy of machine learning is you know you use what works. People like sigmoids. In the old days, you know, I don't know, a couple years ago, people <laughs> people use what's called a perceptron. I love the name. And a perceptron is just a step function, zero or one. These things are hard to train. You actually, as we'll see, we need to be able to calculate a gradient, uh, hyperbolic tangents. And uh, you know, rectified linear units, which are just these crazy, you know, either zero or a linear uh, uh, piece here. So this is this, this is actually state of the art. 
rectify linear units. Whatever that means, these things drain the best. But sigmoids are a nice function that I'll come back to. So right away, you see there's many different choices you could have for your activation function. You put them all together. Here's the basic feed forward, single layer feed forward neural network that will accomplish this digit recognition task. Okay, so the input is my 20 by 20, black and white or grayscale, whatever they all <coughs> are, that's fixed. My output is 10 different labels, 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And that's an activation function, that's a sigmoid. And this is also a sigmoid in what's called a hidden layer. So there's a single hidden layer uh, that has a variable size, I'm just calling it NH. Okay? Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 100, that's something you've got to figure out. So input, hidden, output. Uh, you, you put in the image, signal propagates through, fires one of the output layers. So that's the graphical representation of that function that maps. You know, how do I learn that function? So that's the, mach that's the machine learning part of, of this whole procedure. Okay? So learning is the act of assigning those weights and biases. Okay? Those are what's called the parameters of the neural network. Uh, so you, you do that, it's driven by data. So you take your big set of 70,000 handwritten digits with labels, and you typically split them into what's called a training set and a testing set. So the training set, or validation set, so training or validation. So imagine 60,000 of these things are used to adjust the weights and biases, and then you want to know if you did a good job. You take 10,000 unique images that haven't been seen before by the neural network, and you, you evaluate the performance. You, you validate whether or not it's doing what you think it's supposed to be doing, okay? And to, you know, to, to define a procedure for learning, you need some sort of rule for how you adjust the weights and biases you know, when you input an image. So you input this zero, you, know, you want to adjust the weights. You input a four, you input the one, and you're, you're always updating uh, the neural network during the training stage. So the way that you do that is you define a cost function. And just like there's many different types of activation functions possible, there's many different types of cost functions possible uh, to do this type of, tr of learning or training. So here's just a simple mean squared error. So y is the expected output, which is the label that those high school kids wrote on the, you know, this is a five, when they label that, that's your expected output. Actual is the actual neuron that's fired when you put the image in, right? So those can be vast. You know, if you initialize all your weights and biases at random, those will be very different. So you assign a cost, which is just the sum of the differences squared, uh, sum of the squared differences. And that defines an optimization landscape. And what you're doing when you do the learning is you're starting out at some random weights and biases. Maybe it's up in some peak somewhere. And you're trying to find the essentially global minimum of this landscape. Okay, so that's, that's a fairly common physics problem. We probably, see, we probably do this stuff all the time, maybe without even knowing it. Um, so the, the key is to you know, define the optimization landscape through the cost function. And again, there's many different cost functions. This isn't even the one you should be using. Just a, you know, it's a simple one. You should be using cross entropy or something. Um, and then you have to find a way of, you know, when you start from your random, uh, wherever it is, position, you want to find minima somehow. So you want to traverse the landscape. And that's done through a very simple gradient descent. So industry standard, state of the art, machine learning is done through gradient descent. Okay? So if I say my parameters of my network, the things that I want to optimize are the weights and biases, then uh, you know, gradient descent merely says that I update, so I take lambda to lambda prime, I do for every weight and bias, uh, through the by calculating the gradient of this cost function, and then just looking at the, you know, you're going down the direction, uh, you're going downwards. And so there's an integration constant that's called the learning right there. That's something you choose yourself. Yeah, that's it. Talk over, that's machine <laughs> learning. It's like literally, that's, that's what it is. It's, uh, d you know, defining cost function, finding a way of exploring the landscape, hopefully everything works, okay? And of course, that's not it. Uh, the devil's in the details, as I say here. Um, this type of procedure, you know, people understood this a long time ago. And the, the fact is that, you know, since 2008, 2012, so on, what people have been able to do is really just 
do this optimization procedure uh, you know, in a practical amount of resources and in a reasonable amount of time using today's hardware, right? And, and some of that's through your hardware get, gets getting faster. You have GPUs, blah, blah, blah. Some of it's through the availability of, of data. So like Facebook, you know, we have all this, this data. You have this big, massive data set of all of your photos. Um, but part of it is just through, you know, hard work in optimizing the algorithms. And, you know, a couple details that are important. Uh, maybe first off is, you know, computing the full gradient is difficult. Really, you want the gradient is the sum of gradients for every element of the data set, all x's, good luck. You know, you'll never be able to calculate that in reasonable time. So what people do is they just pull out, say, 10 or 20 uh, of, the train, of the training elements at a time, calculate what's called the gradient over that mini batch, and just hope that it's roughly, you know, in the right direction. Uh, then you can do this many times. You pull out, you know, 10, you pull out another 10, you do that until the 60,000 elements of your training set is exhausted. <laughs> that's called one epoch of training. And you throw them all back in the bucket, you pull out another 10, pull out another 10, that's a second epoch of training. So you train them for many epochs, and uh, you can just keep going forever. It's called stochastic gradient descent. Um, the gradient, yeah, so maybe here, you know, you're, you're updating a parameter, right? So you have to calculate the gradient with respect to the parameters, and the parameters can occur back, actually you know, many layers back in the neural network perhaps. So you have to have some way of, of, uh, of calculating the partial derivative of the cost function uh, for some weight or some bias you know, deep in the network. Well, okay, we're, most, phys most people are physicists here. We call that the chain rule. Uh, uh, machine learning people call that back propagation. Um, actually, you know, I'm kind of making a joke, but this was a big uh, kind of breakthrough, the idea that uh, you could do a, a fast algorithm to calculate essentially the chain rule derivatives back through multiple layers of the network. Again, uh, Hinton was involved in this in the, in the late 80s, and this is still used today. So, and a lot, of, a lot of what you will do when you become a machine learning aficionado is exploring hyperparameters. And hyperparameters are things like the size of this mini batch, that learning rate, uh, what else? The number of hidden units that I mentioned, um, how many epochs you train over. I didn't mention regularization, but there's all sorts of, you know, this is the art and the state of the art, right? You, the structure of the neural network might make sense. You might know what to do, uh, but all these little bells and whistles and uh, things that you have to tweak, that's the, that's the art of, the fine art of hyperparameter searching. Uh, question? Yeah, is the you, you, were, you were talking about there's multiple sometimes multiple layers. But mm -hmm. What why what guides that? Uh, whether you choose like how many layers you need to solve a problem. Yeah. Um, there's okay. So I wasn't going to talk too much about deep learning. Uh, so when you have hierarchical data, that's like faces. And if you look at images of faces, there's things like edges and shadows and blah blah blah. Uh, and then you know the higher level in the hierarchy. You combine those things into, say, noses and eyes and hair and blah, blah, blah. And then at the, another layer, you might have whole faces. And at the next layer, you might have labels for those faces. So roughly, the idea behind deep learning is that hierarchical structure of the data and the fact that different layers separate that out. But there's no good, like, from a physics kind of perspective, there's no real fundamental understanding yet of why deep versus shallow, I, I'd say, works better. I think that's one of the kind of one of the aims of this type of program. So. It's a good question that I don't really have a good answer for. <laughs> okay, so the only the last thing I'm going to say about MNIST for all you kids out there is just go try it. So download TensorFlow. <laughs> so TensorFlow is Google's uh, software libraries for machine learning. And the philosophy is it's the data that's valuable. It's not the algorithms really themselves, right? Google owns all your data already. You use Gmail, it's too late, man. They own it. <laughs> like, they own you. So. So you know the, their philosophy is you know let's just release this let develop let developers use TensorFlow. You can code up a simple feed forward you know one hidden layer neural network uh, in like 20 lines of TensorFlow maybe less, and you can get the MNIST data set right from their tutorial page. And so try it. Do uh, I think 100 hidden units uh, on these 10,000 testing images will misclassify only about two percent, which is pretty good. Okay. Compare that to state of the art. Actually, I think this is there's a new record now. Uh, but in 20, 2013, basically when people started figuring out these deep convolutional networks, 
Uh, the accuracy was, the record was pinned at 0.21% errors, okay? And you can't do much better. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess, as my dad said, high school kids are on drugs. And <laughs> you know, it's just, the fact is that some of these elements of this data set are unclassifiable, right? So basically that 0.2% it's all these drugged up kids here. <laughs> so, but uh, I encourage you to try this again. It's the Ising model of, of uh, supervised learning. Um, so let's turn to the real Ising model. So again, this is funny, but it points out the fact that there, there is some you know, inherent unclassifiability in these types of data sets that you encounter in real life. In physics, it's maybe, maybe we're at an advantage, right? Where we kind of at some point fundamentally understand what's going on behind a lot of our data. So Juan Carasquilla's idea, basically in early 2016, was to just take the strategy and, and apply it uh, not to handwritten digits, but to, like I said, configurations of an Ising model. So here's a ferromagnetic Ising model, SZSE. Each one of these pixels is now the SZSE spin state. And uh, imagine doing my same strategy as for handwritten digits, uh, but on this data. Of, uh, so here's some one element of my training set, say. I raster, I strip out the data into a vector. doesn't matter how you do it. So there's no notion of locality or dimensionality or anything left in this layer. I feed those zeros and ones into my neural network, and I want to fire one of these two labels. And what are the two labels? They're you know, either the high temperature, so I, I should have put a phase diagram here, either the high temperature paramagnetic phase or the low temperature ferromagnetic phase ferromagnetic phase. Okay, so maybe here's a phase diagram. As, we, as you may or may not know, as a function of temperature, this model has a well-defined phase transition between a paramagnet, which is kind of everything random, either up or down randomly, uh, to a ferromagnet, which you know, spontaneously breaks a, a symmetry. So you can either have black or white, right? It's like the simplest image you could imagine, right? And you might have some thermal defects. So what Juan did was he generated this training set uh, on a range of temperatures above and below the Onsager transition. So I think it was 10,000 images above uh, for five different, uh, yeah, above, uh, below for five different temperatures, not too close to the transition. Uh, five times 10,000 images above, okay? Trained the neural network. And then new images were produced. You know, from this, of course, they're produced with classical Monte Carlo. But it's kind of like a black box, you know. The new images are produced, and we can treat that as a test set or a validation set. Uh, and what Juan did is he produced images in the test set that are, are at a variety of temperatures, not including the temperatures here at this, in this training set. So to make a long story short, here's, here's the output of that neural network after training. Okay. So there's only, again, there's only two labels. Low temperature, cold, high temperature, hot. Here, L is the linear size of the lattice. So L by L, so it's a 10 by 10, 20 by 20, two-dimensional lattice. And as you can see for uh, small system sizes, okay, so this is the, uh, you know, this is the cold neuron firing, and at some point it crosses over uh, to the hot neuron firing. And this weird line in the middle is actually that Onsager temperature. So that's the thermodynamic uh, value for the transition temperature. And as you increase the system size, you know, the output of the neural network uh, gets closer and closer to crossing over at that phase transition. So in some sense, it's, it's detecting that phase transition through this crossover. And actually, you can make that statement more accurate. Uh, do I have it here? Yeah. So, okay, so is it, is it seeing the thermodynamic transition? Uh, in the output of these neural networks. So many, you know, many different examples are fed in at each temperature. That's what the error bars are. So you can do a couple things. You could uh, look at the 50% crossing point and say that's where you're kind of maximally confused, right? It's like, I don't, I don't know if it's supposed to be the low temperature label or the hot temperature label, high temperature label. So you look at that 50% point and you say that that's your finite size estimate for the phase transition. And then you increase the system size, so I just plot it as one over L, and you can convince yourself that that you know goes to the thermodynamic value within the error bars. But this, I think this is more fun for the, the experts. Sort of, you can take all these curves and you can collapse them onto a universal scaling function uh, by, by just by adjusting essentially uh, a one critical exponent, right? 
So T is TC minus T or whatever, the distance from the transition. Linear size, one over, the new, uh, one over new. If you do this on the output of the neural network, you get the correct new. You get the correct critical exponent for the Ising transition, which I think is cool. So that kind of tells you that you're seeing what you expect. Again, the nice thing about this physics example is that you can essentially completely understand this analytically if you go back and look at what the neural network's doing. And another thing that Juan did is demonstrate that uh, you can, instead of learning a neural network, all the weights and biases, you can basically um, uh, teach a neural network, uh, you can basically design a neural network analytically with only three no hidden units and uh, all the associated weights and biases you can solve analytically and convince yourself that you're basically just learning the magnetization. So you're learning the order parameter. Uh, up, down, uh, up, you know, fair magnet up, fair magnet down is zero. So I didn't show the model here, but just like we hope in physics, we can model what's going on in the neural network in some simple cases. And so this goes a long way to, you know, what do they call, what do they call it, uh, uh, interpretability of neural networks, right? So I think that's one nice thing about this. So just to make, a, again, a long story short, there's many applications of supervised learning now. Uh, so, for example, you could do transfer learning. I could train a neural network on one system and throw in data from another system. So if I, the simple example, which is in that same paper, if I now produce data on a triangular lattice, uh, ferromagnetic Ising model, I'll detect the transition temperature for the ferromagnetic you know, Ising model. Uh, so it's a different transition temperature there. You can detect hidden correlations. So here's a slightly decorated square lattice with Ising configur configurations. One of these is paramagnetic. And I think it's this one. And this one is um, the ground state of a, a, a Coulomb phase. So it's a, like a ground state of a six vertex model. I can't tell the difference by eye. And I, we're even, we're, I've even biased it by putting the spatial dimension and locality and everything back. Um, but the neural network can easily distinguish these things. So there's some algebraic decay of correlations here. Just, you don't even, if you just assign labels to this, uh, it immediately works. If you try a ground state of the Z2 gauge theory for the experts, it actually doesn't work. So there's some things that you can see by eye that the neural network can't see. Uh, you can look at vortices, uh, and you can replace estimators, you can do all sorts of fun things. Um, but I want to spend a couple minutes on unsupervised learning. So I'm not going to talk in detail about any questions about supervised learning, what, what happened here, what just happened. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, now just the graphic because it's the thing is in the front, so I'm going to go So, right. yeah. so this seems like it's doing better when you have a larger, you know, thing, more pixels, right? Like a 60 by 60 seems to be better than a 10 by 10. Yeah which is sort of counter to most things, right? Most things when you have a, a larger sample space, it does, or not a larger sample space, but like higher dimensionality almost, it does worse. Is there a reason why these do better in those cases? Well, it's doing better because this, the thing I'm looking for is in a limit of L goes infinity. Okay. So the, the thing that I'm trying to find is something in a large L limit. From a machine learning perspective, when my data set gets too big, then the procedural will crap out. Yeah, so like if I go to L, you know, 10 to the 9 by 10 to the 9, there's no way it's going to work. So even though I could be closer to what I'm looking for physically, yeah, I mean, in some sense, the Hilbert space is too big or the, the state space is too big for these algorithms to work. So, At what point do you determine that the percent accuracy, or I guess I've got two questions here. One is like, what's the computational requirements for some of these experiments that you're performing? This you can do in your laptop. Okay. And then what's like the run times you're seeing? I guess minutes. Processing the data. Minutes, here. Yeah. And then at what point do you say, oh, that system's accurate enough, or we've got the most accurate data we're going to get from this neural network? Because you were saying that, like, when do you kind of... Yeah, when do you stop? Yeah, when do you stop? That's up to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I tried stopping a year ago. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, here you can quantify, essentially, uh, you know, the accuracy, you know, these they're, these curves are exact within the error bars. I mean, you can make this just look like a perfectly smooth curve for each one of these sizes, but again, it depends what you want to get out of it. If you want to get out the thermodynamic value of the transition, you can tolerate some errors, some statistical errors and so on. So, I, you know, it's, it's a tough question to answer. I mean, yeah. So you have 
had uh, you talked about layers and you compare it to how Facebook will recognize spaces. It starts with the fundamentals and then it goes up layer by layer. So in this example of the ISO model, what kind of layer were you looking at? So this example only had one layer. Okay. So you could stack layers on top of each other, mm -hmm. and then you got to ask why. Um, <laughs> so what you might want to do is try to get this accuracy with less network parameters. And that's basically the idea behind deep learning. You can only train, you know, it's like you can only train so many parameters. You, you know, the computer is only possible of doing this optimization uh, so accurately for so many parameters. So generally, you want to have as few weights and biases as possible. So one hope or one belief is that in deep networks, you can get the same accuracy with less parameters if you stack them. But that's a whole other can of worms. How do you determine um, in the deep learning which nodes, which deep layers and layers go in what order? Um, well, you, you, you just make it unstructured because like, you're learning the hierarchy. So you don't, you don't a priori put any information. You just put layers. You, know, you might decrease the number of neurons in each layer, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you decrease them and open them up again, like in a variational autoencoder. But the, uh, you know, the weights and biases, essentially you start them at random. Um, with this particular example, you said that there was an a, a analytical model that you yeah. had just three nodes yeah. in, in the hidden layer. Yeah. If I were to put like ten nodes and train it, would the weights for all but three of the nodes no I, ideally be zero? No. Well, ideally yes, but in practice no, and that's kind of interesting. I mean, it's I I'll, I'll say it's like the inverse problem. It's like you want to learn. You want to learn some sort of, it's a function, but I can imagine calling it something like a Hamiltonian from, uh, from basically samples in state space. And there is a ground truth. There is an absolute minimum to that uh, or, uh, f free energy funnel, whatever I was calling it, the optimization landscape. But you can basically get good accuracy even if you're in some local minimum. And those local minima, in my experience, don't look anything like the, f the physical model that is in, you know, they can be all sorts of crazy things. And that's really interesting, but I don't know why. <laughs> so how many images did you generate for this again? How many what? Images. Generated in the training set, it was like, you know, hundreds, hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands or something like that. Here, I don't even know. And hundreds uh, of thousands. you generate them randomly? Mm. No, we important sample them with, uh, according to the proper thermal distribution, using some Monte Carlo method. Monte. Yeah, so just cl classical Monte Carlo, really simple stuff. I'm out of time, but I'm going to go on for five more minutes, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah, cool. You just, stand, you just stand up when it's time to... <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through this fast, and it's going to get technical, but I think this is the best part. So I want to talk about unsupervised learning, which is most of our data. And I have, you know, in an MNIST example, I have many different things I can do. I can try to find these 10 clusters automatically. I can try to associate them, blah, blah, blah. But what I want to do is I want to generate, uh, I want to do generative modeling. So what generative modeling is, is imagine I feed in a whole bunch of images and I want my neural network to spit back out its, its idea of what an image is or generate me a set of images, okay? Those, those pictures of my students, at the first, they, these are generative modeled based on some style transfer neural network. So this is, generative modeling is used in all the style transfer uh, type machine learning stuff. Okay, now, try to follow me here real quick. So, I have a data set that was drawn from an unknown distribution. And, and there's no labels. So imagine my uh, previous set, uh, set of uh, data from the Ising model. It was drawn from a Boltzmann distribution with a Hamiltonian that was that 2D Ising model. Okay, I'm calling this PS, probably S for spin. But this is my physical distribution. And what I want to do is... You know, I don't a priori know this. It's a black box, even though I, I, even though I know it because I use Monte Carlo to generate the samples. Imagine I don't know that. What I want to do is learn that distribution, okay? And that's one of the goals of, of generative modeling. So can I learn the distribution with a neural network, okay? And the distribution will be parameterized by all the weights and biases. Let me cut off all those output layers. I don't need, there's no labels anymore. So imagine I have a neural network that looks like this with no output la layers. That's basically a restricted Bolson machine, it's called. But 
The other difference is these are no longer activation functions. These are random variables. So instead of activating in one direction the signal, uh, a, a Bolson machine is a type of stochastic neural network that just has visible and hidden neurons that can be 0 or 1. There's weights and biases. So these are my weights. I now have biases on <coughs> visible and hidden. And then this is my model distribution. Okay, this, I want to learn the weights and biases. This represents a probability distribution because I define essentially an energy. So now this looks like the Boltzmann distribution, but it's the Boltzmann distribution of the machine, hence the name. Okay? So one of the goals of unsupervised learning, and the goal that I'm uh, trying to uh, achieve here, is to model, the, uh, model my physical distribution by sending in data and building up weights and biases so that this full probability distribution is as best of a, as good as a model as possible. This energy is just the usual energy, Ising energy. So my weights are my bonds. Uh, these are visible and hidden units. So it connects visible and hidden, but nothing within the layers. And I have fields, okay? What I want to do is tune the machine. So I want to do the same learning procedure. Uh, but I want to generate a distribution that's such that as I, if I trace over the hidden, so I have a latent space of hidden variables. When I trace over that latent space of hidden variables, my P lambda on the visible layer is as close as possible to the target, which was my unknown distribution, right? So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to train a Bolson machine. I'm going to train it on Ising model data or transverse field Ising model data or some sort of physical Hamiltonian. And then once the machine's trained, I'm going to sample the machine. Okay, so I'm going to run the machine, uh, sampling these these random variables, and then from that I can calculate a conventional estimator, like the energy or the specific heat of the visible layer. Okay, so that's the strategy. I'm going to take a machine. I'm going to take a set of data, train a machine, have the machine generate configurations, and then from those configurations, I'm going to calculate energies and so on, and that'll tell me how well I did. So I'm, I'm going to skip all this stuff, but how, how do I train the machine? Uh, there's no cost function anymore. Uh, we look at the basically relative entropy between the distributions. It produces some uh, approximate gradient descent uh, algorithm called contrastive divergence, which is again uh, invented by Jeff Hinton. Um, the restriction on the weights and biases is very important for the training, but I won't tell you why. And uh, it's because I need to calculate conditional probability distributions. I sample hidden, visible, hidden, visible. This is standard machine learning stuff. The conditional probability distributions, say for a variable here being one, conditioned, so it's like Bayesian, conditioned on this hidden, net, hidden layer. Turns out to be a sigmoid. So the sigmoid neuron comes back in, but it's now the rate of firing. Okay, so that's, that's the relationship between uh, these different types of neural networks. And here's some results. So now, I've trained one of these Bolson machines on that same data from the Ising model, but now I've asked the machine to reproduce the energy. So when I, I sample this machine after training, and I just look at the configurations on the visible layer, and I calculate the energy in this, using the same, you know, I have some Markov chain of M steps, and I just take a running average. So here's the results. Here's an, here, let's look at a specific heat. Here's the exact specific heat calculated from a data set produced by a black box uh, for us 8 by 8 lattice. And here's a Bolson machine with different numbers of hidden units, 4, 16, 64 hidden units. And by 64 hidden units, I'm basically converging to the right answer. Okay. So this demonstrates that the underlying representation of, I'll call it the wave function, or the probability distribution, uh, has a convergence parameter that is essentially the number of hidden units. Okay. So I can, I can store, I, I can represent anything like this, any, any distribution that I want. And in a thermodynamic sense, whether or not this thing scales efficiently is just the question of whether the, the amount of hidden units remains polynomial in the physical size of the system. Okay? So that's not answering this question, uh, but I can imagine doing finite size scaling and, and then uh, exploring this. But what's interesting now is that I can store quantum wave functions like this. So I can imagine, let's imagine a simple case where I have a wave function that has no uh, phase associated with it. So it's just an amplitude. So that, you know, the weight, as you learn in quantum mechanics, psi squared is essentially a probability distribution. So what I want to do in this simple case 
is take measurements, maybe it's from some other black box that's theoretical, or maybe I'm taking measurements in a laboratory. And I want to take those measurements, and I want to train the parameters of the Bolson machine. Okay, and that'll be a representation of the wave function now. So let me, uh, you know, so that's my effective classical model is the Bolson machine. Okay, so let me take a transverse fieldizing model. These don't commute, so it's quantum mechanical. But let me produce measurements in the Z basis, uh, Z basis. Um, I got Canadian there. For that. So, and and I'll, I'll just like I did on the previous case, I'll, I'll I'll train that Bolton machine and then I'll measure the Bolton machine. So what's neat now is I can measure the Bolton machine in the original Z basis, the Z basis, or I can measure it in, in the X basis or any other basis. So here's the magnetization as a function of transverse field, and I've only trained this thing in the in the Z basis, which is the red, but I can perform measurements on the Bolton machine itself. Uh, in the other basis, which is blue. So actually red and blue are from the machine that's converged, and the dotted lines are the exact values from Quantum Monte Carlo. So you see I'm getting information on observables that weren't contained in the original data set because they're because I have a, a good a perfect representation of the wave function. And you can say, well maybe that just some bases work. I can actually measure the entanglement entropy. Here's the second Renyi entropy for a 1D transverse field Ising model. And I'm measuring the entropy along chain, the chain with different fields. And I can exactly reproduce the entanglement entropy uh, from the Bolson machine. So it's basis independent. If I have a phase in my wave function, it's more complicated, but I can still do it. So one, if I have an amplitude and a phase, I encode the amplitude in one set of hidden units, and I encode the phase in another. Uh, now imagine I'm producing a data set for some unknown wave function, and we did a synthetic example here. Uh, that has amplitude and phase. So here's what's called a W state, 1, 0, 0, 0. You know, there's 20 numbers in here, 20 qubits. Uh, it's a superposition of all of these elements. With I, We just assigned random phases. So we trained on 20 qubits, 10 to the 5, roughly in the, in the training set. Um, and, and my student produces plot. So let me think. This is my 20 elements in my... Uh, 20 elements in my superposition. The colors mean nothing. And the, the, the distance between the middle and the edge is the, value, the phase. So this, this is a theta 1. I don't know. He's not, he's not here, so I can criticize. Um, so th this is the value of the phase. So this is, this is the exact synthetic data set that's been produced. And here's the reproduction from an RBM trained with, I forget how many hidden units. So this, this tells you that you basically, you've encoded a quantum wave function uh, to high accuracy with this type of you know, stochastic neural network. So once you see this, then you realize that you can use machine learning to take measurements from quantum devices, quantum computers, uh, you know, small uh, amounts of qubits, whatever you need, and you can perform essentially tasks on these, like tomography. Uh, so this is one thing we're exploring. So when you have data coming from different experiments and so on, uh, how can you use this to design or to, you know, it's like reverse engineer what's going on and therefore contribute to the design. So there's two uh, fields that are uh, addressing this in quantum information. <laughs> I've just cited my own papers, but there's many now. Um, so one of them is what's called a, a error correction or, or decoding. And that's when you have data that has uh, correlated errors and, and measurements of those errors, which can, can be different. So you can essentially train Bolson machines on those error patterns and ask the machine to uh, generate uh, ways to correct those error patterns. And so this is very close to uh, what's going to be uh, implemented in actual fault-tolerant quantum computing hardware. Because what happens in a quantum computer is to perform error correction, you essentially need to couple it to a classical computer and have that thing, you know, the faster it can do the error correction, the better in terms of the error rate. And so it just makes sense that machine learning, I think, is going to be uh, involved there. And, and this is the procedure to do that. Tomography is this, is when you take all these measurements of a quantum wave function or quantum density matrix, and you basically try to reconstruct uh, what's going on in the measurement, which is usually imperfect. Uh, so this is another area that we're exploring uh, with, with, with many groups using these Bolson machines. And so here's some, here's some data on the phase of some 2D you know, lattice, and here's a reproduction of the Bolson machine. I just put it up there because it looks pretty. It doesn't mean anything. There's so much to do. I mean, I'm just going to stop, but you know, there's theoretical questions. Uh, 
you know, do these types of neural networks give us some sort of polynomial representation of wave functions? If they do, is it anything new? Um, if they don't, has machine learning just improved the prefactor of the exponential so much that we can like, you know, essentially do something with it, like on, on today's hardware? So that's a possibility. For the condensed matter people, you know, what is, what is the underlying power in these types of machines? Um, what's the connection between uh, the renormalization group and, and these deep structures? And how does our existing theory of tensor networks and uh, Mara and PEPs and so on feed into our understanding of, 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 of neural networks? Do, you know, if, if I can create a quantum computer uh, that allows me to encode a neural network uh, with quantum mechanics, so I have a restricted Boltzmann machine, but I also put a transverse field on the hardware, is there any reason to do that? You know, do I get speed ups in terms of classical learning? You know, will my quantum computer perform machine learning faster than my classical computer? Nobody knows the answer to that question. I mean, just period. And you know, if machine learning is so good, why do we need a quantum computer? Wow, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you know, I just want to end with this slide because, you know, people have used machine learning uh, in, in physics for a long time, uh, especially in astro and high energy. CERN was one of the pioneers of, of machine learning. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that, but I, we should also look further back. And I think this is kind of interesting because Bishop is a famous uh, machine learning textbook. And if you read your first like, paragraph out of Bishop, he's motivating machine learning with physics. So he says, you know, basically searching for patterns in data is, is a fundamental problem somehow. And he, and he, talk, you know, he cites Kepler. Kepler looking through all this crazy you know, German data about the planets and, and, and the reverse engineering of planetary mo equations for planetary motion. Or uh, Balmer, you know, Balmer series, you look at the spectrum in the Balmer series and somehow back out one over n squared and from that, you know, quantum mechanics, right? So he's saying that this type of pattern recognition, you know, created modern physics essentially. So maybe it's not so crazy to think that all we're doing is kind of updating our tools for this type of pattern recognition. So. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs>
That's your input information. And there's just two hidden layers that don't talk to each other, but they okay, talk so to you sigma. Can yeah. To one layer and then also then to another layer. Yeah. And those layers don't talk to each other. Right. I glossed over a lot here. So, but. is that the same as just training that you're, you know, you have just training two different systems? Not exactly, because in your KL divergence, um, the this wave function occurs, you know, as your probability distribution. So you need to have both sets of parameters, like in the cost function when you update. So it's it's not the same as having two separate machines. Uh, yeah, they're coupled at at some level, and it's basically in the KL divergence. Yeah. You talked briefly about um, so you're creating these things with Monte Carlo, right? So you basically you're feeding something in, you're fitting to it. You talk about overfitting and the potential to well, what's your feeling on how well you can extrapolate all this? Yeah. So I never found a problem with overfitting in our data sets, and one reason is we can produce. I mean, one reason is we're, I guess, being smart about this, and like, like for example, in this case, you can imagine overfitting here. If I if I just produce samples at one temperature and I had a certain amount of thermal defects. And you know, I had a low number of samples. I can imagine if I had too many parameters overfitting to that. And we kind of artificially, you know, we control our data sets. So we, we spread this out enough that we kind of generalize without a lot of regularization. Um, but there are cases where you might not have a lot of data, or you might not have the full set of data. So one example is if uh, you, you'll get overfitting in a very serious way here if you don't have measurements in another basis. You know, so it's it's more less maybe less overfitting and, and more uh, the inability to generalize to the full structure of this wave function. Um, but it's 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 different than the way we think of overfitting in conventional data sets, and I still haven't quite sorted it all out. So we actually use way less regularization than uh, in kind of conventional machine learning. So um, just out of curiosity, how similar is the uh, is this architecture for a neural network to actual neurons? And I mean, my, my, my understanding yeah. is of what I remember about neurons is that the, it's, it's, the structure is kind of very different on, on a fundamental level. Um, I don't think there's anything you know, amongst friends. I don't think there's any reason to think about real neurons. <laughs> um, uh, that being said, I think it was a big motivating factor behind like I said, it was, you know, von Neumann himself said, "Look at the, no, n the neurons, right?" And Hinton definitely thinks about neurons when he, he when they think about hierarchies, especially. It's like your retina has a whole bunch of that's the input layer, that's the visible layer. Then you have a hierarchy of like layers of neurons behind that. But you know, when I'm thinking about physical data, and I know fundamentally, you know, the limits of measurement error and tomography and so on. I don't see a lot of reason to think about. Neurons. So the way I'm constructing these things are basically have no relation. So the supervised uh, machine learning. Mm -hmm. When you look for the minimum using the gradient descent, mm -hmm. that you are looking for the minimization because you know the training sample. I mean, you know what are the levels. Yeah. How in your Boltzmann uh, machine learning, I mean, the answer in the answer for right. learning. Yeah. If you are going for a probability distribution function for yeah. random variable. What would you minimize? Because yeah. it could like suddenly be, I mean, that your answers could be degenerate, right? So, oh yeah. So, you, you minimize the KL, the kobach leibler divergence, which is the, basically the entropy, you know, between, it's like the relative entropy between uh, what the machine's generating, like literally what the, the machine's generating and what the, you know, the data set gave you. This isn't unique either. This is not. So, but in, so the data set gives versus the machine. So there's an underlying distribution. So you've drawn samples from an underlying distribution for your training set, but you don't know what that distribution is. Okay, so that's PS. So what you what you want to, in, you know, theoretically minimize is it's somehow the distance. It's like a distance measure. It's not symmetric. But you're measuring the distance between the, this distribution, which you don't know, and the one that you do know, or you, at least you can sample from your machine. So it's the, you know, it's like you have two distributions. And there's some distance, and you want to minimize that distance, and that's that's your cost. So with the, the the weights and biases versus the uh, yeah. molecular probability distribution function of the input data. Yeah. So exactly. So what you have, the knobs you have are your weights and biases, basically. And so you, you move that p lambda with the weights and biases until it overlaps that original distribution as much as possible. And the procedure to do that is is fairly involved. 
Like you have to basically boil that all down into something that uh, like I, I don't have time for. Uh, but it's called it's called contrastive divergence. And and again, this is one of these big you know taking this object and turning it into an algorithm that allows you to do stochastic gradient descent on KL is is again one of these big breakthroughs I think that you know makes Hinton deserving of his godlike status in the field. <laughs> so it's an algorithmic. This is an algorithmic solution to uh, difficult. Uh, you know, this is basically an exponentially difficult calculation here. If you if you use the KL to uh, detect clustering, PS would be the probability distribution function of a cluster. I, yeah, a two dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. How, how does this compare to like some classical ways of determining the probability distribution? You know, like, just from normal statistics, right? Do, do these methods seem to you know get to a distribution quicker than? So, what, from what I understand, these are scalable. Then that's why they use neural networks is because you can stack them up in these big deep things that are, which means, what scalable means for me, I think, is like I can do bigger numbers of visible units. So my data, you know, the, or the number of pixels, can you know, scales. You can do higher and higher resolution images and stuff like that. So from what I understand, which is just folklore that I've heard, uh, these types of things scale better than some conventional methods. Yeah. Okay, so I think time is coming up. <laughs> I want Roger to make a prediction. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so, quantum Kagoma Heisenberg model, ah. ground state, when will machine learning tell us what it is? Oh, there's people working on that. Yes. I guarantee it. Okay. I, I, I cut a slide out here. Okay. So, oh, okay. so Matthias Troyer and actually it was Giuseppe Carleo who did this, his postdoc. They took a Bolton machine and they turned it into a. Uh, a, an onsaut's wave function for variational Monte Carlo. Uh, this one has no sign problem. They did a Heisenberg model, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, uh, sorry, on a square lattice Heisenberg model. But it's anti Fermat Heisenberg on a square lattice. You know the exact energy from quantum Monte Carlo in that case. So this is the, this is the energy, uh, you know, this is the difference in energy. And they've beaten tensor networks. So that's for alpha, again, alpha is your convergence parameter. So when you, when you have a fixed, you know, system size, 10 by 10, so this is 100. Uh, when you have alpha equals whatever, 8 or 16 or something like that, you're beating state-of-the-art tensor networks. So in principle, this, is, this has no data. This is like a variational Monte Carlo. Uh, there's no, you're not training it on data. Mm -hmm. You've turned that data. That KL divergence is sucked in here as some, op, uh, some variational optimization procedure. But when I see this, it makes me wonder if they can beat the best variational energy for, you know, it should be the same procedure. But... I haven't seen anything yet, so. Next so, year. Next year. <laughs> <laughs> One year from today. <laughs> All right, so. Thank you. So, so each configuration, so the error bar is like if I feed in 100 configurations and I ask it to classify it, and I get 99 of them right and one wrong, that'll give you that error bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 